Hello and welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, I'm Nurse Alyssa and today we're going to be discussing the best practice standards for burns, okay? So prevention and management of burns. But first, if you could hit that subscribe button, it would be greatly appreciated as it truly does help my channel reach more people. So let's get started, guys. So I've decided to do these best practice standards simplified, okay? So when I first got into the wound care world, um, I was always receiving best practice wound care. And it's like, okay, so what what is that exactly? Like, um, you like people get really confused when doctors write that. And where I'm located, we received that quite frequently. So um, that's when I started doing a lot of research and then eventually going to be a wound care specialist. Um, later on, it did make things a lot more clear. So we'll start with this, as you can see here on the page. This is the circle of care for all wounds that you should be following every time you have a wound, okay? So this is best practice standard care for your patient. So number one, assess and or reassess. Number two, set goals. Number three, assemble a team. Number four, establish and implement a plan of care. And number five, evaluate outcomes. Now, if you hit number five and you have not met your goal, then you will go back to number one, reassess. Okay, so let's take a deeper dive into assess or reassess. So when it comes to burns, there is a ton of different assessment tools out there that you can use, okay? Okay. So for burn size, hand burn severity, mortality risk assessment, anxiety assessment, quality of life assessment, coping assessment, scar assessment, wound assessment, pain assessment, and even nutrition assessment. Okay. So there is so many different assessment tools that actually need to be used for a burn patient. So burns are very complex. As you can see, there's many different assessment tools that are out there and you need to know and choose the right ones for your patient. We also need to identify the causative factor. So what caused the burn, okay? Is it a thermal burn? Is it a radiation burn, a chemical burn, an electrical burn, a friction burn? What type of burn is it? So when we're assessing a burn, patient um, obviously it's bad enough where they do need assessment. They've come to the hospital. Okay. We need to be assessing them using the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. So what does that stand for? A is airway. So we want to assess for airway obstruction or injury. Um, breathing. We want to evaluate their breathing and ventilation. C for circulation. Um, we want to assess for signs of bleeding, hypovolemia, uh, burn shock. Now, disability, because we want to complete a neurological assessment, okay, to establish the patient's level of consciousness. Um, exposure for E. So we want to expose the patient's skin to more accurately determine the burn injury. And then F, we have fluid restoration, okay, so reintroducing fluids to the body because burns do take a lot of fluids from the body. So that's our initial assessment. We have to look at those first, okay? Those are of our those are of most important. And then we do have our secondary assessment which includes pain assessment, our head to toe examination. So we're going to rule out any secondary injuries, um a systematic and detailed history of the patient's general health identify any specific issues related to the burn injury, a wound assessment, and quality of life assessment. Okay, so those are secondary. First, always airway, breathing, circulation of most importance. Okay, so from top to bottom, that's what we need to be looking at. So once our assessment's done, we then need to look at the environment. Okay, so an assessment of social determinants really of health to determine if the patient has necessary support to achieve their goal. So the assessment should include factors such as income, employment, food security, housing, education, social support, um, their health behaviors, and access to health care. So we do need to look at every aspect when providing care to a patient to make sure that 
we, they can actually follow through with a plan of care. So with the actual burn assessment, we need to be looking at the cause, depth, size, severity, okay? This is going to help us determine the best course of care for the patient, okay? So scalds, they tend to be superficial, partial thickness, um, tissue damage that may involve a large area of skin. Emergent scalds, they can result um, in more severe burn injuries because of the increased duration of contact between the heat and the skin. Contact burns, they tend to be deep partial thickness or full thickness tissue damage and involve less skin area than other types of burns. And then flame injuries, they, they really vary in depth. Now, electrical burns, okay, so normally there's a point of entry and a point of exit that you can see. Okay, now this will really help determine the path of, of where the burn has gone, because if it's going in one area and out lower, you know, you can see the path down to the area. It's almost like there is burn throughout. Okay, so we can see the damage throughout just on the course of where it's gone. Um, now, radiation burns. So these are skin injuries that really range from redness, skin necrosis, ulceration, and even death. And then with chemical burns, we have to be very cautious with chemical burns because um, they can burn up for 72 hours, okay? And this is after the initial contact. So they do continue to burn until they are inactivated. So um, this is normally by uh, washing them off. Um, but once again, it still can continue burning for up to 72 hours. So burns can be divided up into three zones. So we have zone of coagulation, zone of stasis, and zone of hyperemia. So let's look at the zone of coagulation first. So this is the center of the wound. It had the most contact with the burn source. So it is even irreversible full thickness tissue damage with no tissue perfusion. So really it's dead tissue. It appears white or charred and this tissue will not recover. Next we have the zone of stasis. So this surrounds the zone of coagulation. It is a deep partial thickness injury and it does have decreased tissue perfusion. So not as much blood flowing to the area. The tissue does appear red initially and later will turn white. Um, and it may blanch with pressure. With good wound management, this tissue will likely recover. And then we have the zone of hyperemia. So this is at the border of the wound. It is superficial, official, partial thickness injury with good tissue perfusion. So the blood is flowing to the tissue well. Um, it does appear red. It blanches with pressure, and likely to recover. Now, when looking at burn depth, as you can see here from this chart, um, we have first degree burn, second degree burn, deep second degree burn, third degree, and fourth degree. Now, those are really what show a burn depth. How far did it go? What type of tissue is it affect? So for superficial or first degree burn, this is just the epidermis. So the outer layer of skin, um, we have intact skin. It's blanchable. It is red, um, but there's no blisters. Okay. Now with the second degree burns, we do have um, partial thickness of the dermis. Okay. So it involves the epidermis, but that top layer of skin is going to be damaged and lost. So we either have intact or ruptured thin serum filled blisters. Then we have our full thickness third degree burns. So this is full thickness skin loss. Um, underlying structures are not exposed for third degree burns. Um, it's non black blanchable. Um, the tissue is leathery, pale, um, cherry red or brown in color and dry. So um, eschar may be present in these third degree burns and they are insensitive to pain or pressure, okay? So they cannot feel the pain of a third degree burn. If it's very painful, you know it's either a second degree or a first degree burn because those are super, super painful. But a third degree burn, they aren't actually going to feel because it has caused nerve damage. And then fourth degree burns. So these are full thickness skin loss, um, exposed or directly palpable right under um, the underlying structure. You can actually feel that, okay? Um, this is non-blanchable, once again, leathery, pale, 
red, brown, white in color, and dry. Um, Eskar may be present. And once again, they are also going to be um, insensible to pain or pressure. So they cannot feel pain or pressure in a third degree burn or a fourth degree burn. Then we have burn size. So I personally like to use the rule of nines. Now there is many different um, ways that you can measure the size of a burn, but the rule of nines is normally the one that I like to use and I believe is used most frequently. Um, that's what I've seen in most places. So um, as you can see here, this shows the rule of nine. So the front of the legs, nine on each. The back of the legs will be nine. So most of like you just have to calculate the percentage of body involvement. So it's all split up here, as you can see. Um, if it's front and back, then you just add the totals for each, okay? So say if it was a whole arm, from tip of the fingers to up here, you would add 4.5 plus 4.5 because it's front and back, okay? Um, if it's just the front of the whole arm, then it's just 4.5. So that's how you kind of get the percentage of body that has been damaged by burn. So we take that number and it really gives us the severity of the burn. So we have minor, moderate, and major severity, okay? So as you can see here on this chart, we have um, partial thickness involving 15% of total body surface area, um, and that's for adult or 10% for children and adults, okay, under the age of 40, or full thickness involving less than 2% of total body surface area, not on the face, eyes, ears, hands, or feet, okay? And then we go to moderate and major, okay? So you just kind of look at where the involvement is on the body and use this chart to determine where their severity lies, okay? So as with all wounds, you are then going to look at tissue type and amount, bacteria balance, um, exudate type and amount, presence of odor, the type of the wound, edge, the peri wound. We still need to look at all that, okay? When it does come to burns, we have to look at that for every any type of wound. And that brings us to step two, setting goals. So not all wounds have a goal of being healed, okay? So we have to look at them. Are we trying to prevent are we trying to heal? Are we trying to just manage the wound? Okay, so same goes for burns. So obviously prevention is always of most important, but unfortunately they do occur. So um, we do have to set goals for them. So we want to identify goals based on either prevention or healability of the wound. So we do want to use SMART goals, okay? So we want to have obviously wound closure, we want to stabilize the wound or prevent the wound from breaking down, okay? Um, we want to reduce the amount of necrotic tissue, we want to reduce the bacterial burden, maintain a just moist wound environment, decrease the number of wound dressing changes, okay? Wound dressing changes, they can be painful, with burns, but this also help allow the wound to heal. So the longer we can leave a dressing on for, not interrupt it and let it be at that healing temperature, it will let that wound heal for longer amounts of time. If we're opening it up twice a day and it takes a couple hours each time um, for that wound to go back into healing temperatures, we're not getting as much healing as we would if we left it for 24 or 48 hours. We will want to have prevention of scarring or improved scar quality, limb preservation, and improve nutrients and hydration. Okay, so those are our SMART goals that we want to look at. We also want to identify quality of life and symptom control goals. So these may include pain reduction and management, reduction management of um, itch related to the wound, maintaining or improving range of motion, contractor reduction, restoring independence, returning to work, home, or school, or even leisure activities, reduced anxiety and stress, and improved coping strategies. So once 
that's done, we've set our goals um, for all of that, we want to assemble a team. So really, we're just looking at the team, making sure, especially with burns, it happens very quickly that the team is assembled. But we want to make sure that the patient has everybody that they need as part of the team. So that's healthcare providers, service providers, but we also want to enlist patients and their families. So any supporting family members who are going to be there, who are able to help them, we want to enroll them in our team and make sure that they are aware um, of everything that's going on. Let them be part of the team for creating the plan of care so that it can be followed through because a lot of times they're not at hospital for all that long and they're being discharged home and they are a major part of the team. So we just want to make sure that we're organizing our team and making sure that everybody's doing their part. And then number four is really establishing and implementing the plan of care. So assessment is quite quickly as we've already discussed in this model for burns because we need to make sure that airway, breathing, circulation haven't been affected by the burn, okay? So it was discussed up in stage one, but here we're going to establish, implement plan of care. So like we've already discussed, the A, B, C, D, E, F, it has been done, okay? So um, next we kind of go on to the management, secondary assessment, and nutrition. So we're going to talk more about nutrition nutrition in step four here for burns. So the energy patients require for burns is significantly higher, okay, for energy. So protein increases, carbohydrates need to increase. Now just a note with glucose, so hyperglycemia and insulin resistance is not uncommon post major burn injury, okay? So we need to watch out for that. Um, lipids, so your fat are required to prevent essential fat fatty acid deficiency. And we also need to make sure that we're monitoring our um, micronutrition. So this is our zinc, copper, selenium, B1, C, and E. So those are all suggested with burn. And they're actually suggested for all, all chronic wounds. So optimizing the local wound environment. So we always start off with cleansing. So we're going to use a non-toxic, hypoallergenic, uh, readily available, cost-effective, easy to use, a uh, wound solution, wound cleanse solution. So a lot of times this is our normal saline or potable water. Then we move on to debriding. So is there debridement needed for the wound? A lot of times for burns there is. So this is removal of narcotic tissue, any biofilms. So this could include uh, surgical, conservative sharp debridement, mechanical, autolytical, um, even a combination of, of different debridement methods. We want to manage bacterial burden. So evaluate for signs and symptoms using our nerds and stonies, obtain appropriate specimen collection um, if required, and then managing moisture balance. So we want to choose the right dressing for each stage of wound healing to keep the wound just moist, okay? A wound should be just as moist as our eyeball. So as you can see here, I have added in kind of advanced therapies, dressing categories, so the acrylic, um, alginates, films, foams, gelling fibers, hydrocolloids, hydrogels. There's really um, different times where we use each of these. So I did just add this in. I'm not really going to go over it, um, but it's there if you do need it to pause um, and look to see which one is best for the wound that you're dealing with. And then lastly, we have step Five. So we're going to evaluate the outcome. So we want to determine if the goals have been met or not. Now, as you can see here in this chart, it does show kind of the expected outcome for the different types of um, burns and how long that they're going to take. So superficial, three to five days, really no scarring. Um, second degree burn um, is 14 to 21 days. But then when we get into the deep partial, um, so the deep second degree burn, third degree and fourth degree burn. These do have prolonged healing times. They 
may require skin graft um, amputation for the uh, fourth degree. It really, it really depends. But those are the expected outcomes for those types of burns. Now, if they have not been met, we do need to once again reassess the patient. So their wound, their environment, see what's going wrong, why we have not met our goal. So when we have realistic goals, they should be pretty in line. Um, so we, we need to discover why we're not meeting those. So that's all that I have for this video. I hope you did find it helpful in realizing what it takes to take care of a, of a single wound and the whole plan of care. Um, so many people go right to, okay, what am I going to put on this? How am I going to bandage it? But there's so much more involved in best practice standard for wound care. Um, so we need to definitely be incorporating that. That's number one. And then really, once we have all that, what's our goals? Um, we can really determine, okay, what are we going to put on this wound? How is it in line with our goals? Okay. Um, but that's all I have for this video, guys. Once again, I hope you did find it helpful and I hope to catch you in my next one. Bye for now.